I want to thank you all for joining us today. I'm Angela Barlow. I'm Dean of the Graduate School, and it is a privilege to get to work with you all and to share information related to uh, being a graduate assistant here at UCA. I'm joined by John Scott Kelly, and John Scott will tell you more about himself later on um, in this hour that we have with you, but we're going to go ahead and get started. And so my goals today are <clears throat> one, to reveal six facts about graduate assistantships that I think every GA should know. I have one key lesson that I want to be sure to highlight for you all. And then we're going to talk about overall well-being for G graduate assistants, and that's where John Scott is going to um, come in and share information related to that. As we go through this um, information that I'm sharing, I am using a series of scenarios, and so just a few comments about those scenarios. They are all based on actual happenings. Um, I've changed the name. Sometimes I've changed a little bit of the context. But they're all things that have happened in the past year that made me go, hmm, well, if that student had been listening at graduate assistant orientation, they would have known that. So I'm hoping that by using the scenarios and really highlighting those key facts, um, that it will help to prevent some of these same things happening again this year. So with that, let's take a look at the first scenario that I have. And it is about Jamal, who is a graduate administrative assistant or GAA. And like all other graduate assistants, Jamal is paid twice a month. So we pay our um, folks on the 15th of the month and then again on the last day of the month. And so on December 31st, Jamal did not receive a paycheck. And of course he called the graduate school and was asking, you know, basically what's up with this? Surely there's been an error. And because he really was needing that paycheck. So that's our first scenario. And it's going to introduce us into some information. And you can be thinking about how that information relates to the scenario. So the first thing um, that's important to this is that you do need to know what type of graduate assistant position you have. And our options are a graduate teaching assistant, graduate research assistant, the graduate administrative assistant, which is what Jamal was, or a graduate assistant residential, which is basically um, someone who works in housing. So I want to launch my poll. So if you'll take a moment to put your response in there, and if you're not sure, you can mark unsure, and that's fine too, but this will give me a sense of who all's in the audience, as well as um, who uh, is unsure in our group as well. <clears throat> So the responses are coming in and I'll give you all just a few more seconds. And I will end the poll and share the results just so that you can see. So most of us, about half of us today are GTAs. And so that means that you are um, either the instructor of record for a class or you're helping someone else who's teaching the class. Maybe you're grading papers or doing other behind the scenes. Maybe you're prepping the lab stations or what have you. So those are GTAs. Graduate research assistants, which represent about 16% of you all today, are a lot of those are funded through um, grant money. So you've got a grant that's about research. So they hire GRAs. Um, sometimes they're regular uh, graduate school dollars, and those are people that are helping faculty engage in their research. Graduate administrative assistants typically have more of an office-focused um, assignment. We see those a lot of times like in the Office of Diversity and Inclusion and places like that on campus. We have a couple of um, housing GAs, which is awesome, and then we've got a few that are not sure. So let me move this poll off of the page so that I don't see it. Um, okay, so why does it matter? Like, why does knowing what type of GA you are matter? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One is that the majority of your time, which our Human Resources Department, or HR, says means 60% of your time, should be, um, should engage you in job responsibilities that align with that assignment. So if you're a GTA, that means that at least 60% of your time is related to those instructional responsibilities. Or if you are a research 
GA, then at least 60% of your time should be assigned to research related responsibilities. Um, there's nothing wrong with a department saying, hey, GA, do you mind answering the phone or making these copies for us? That would be very helpful. There's nothing wrong with that until that gets to becoming the majority of your time. Then we're violating the Fair Labor Standards Act. We're violating the expectations of the university. Um, so you, again, one reason it's important to know what type of GA you are is so that you'll know what it is you're supposed to be spending most of your time doing. The second reason <clears throat> is that it does uh, relate to pay periods and the paychecks. And that's because the graduate administrative assistants do not receive a paycheck on December 31st. Um, I can go into that if somebody wants to know as to why that's the case. It is related to the Fair Labor Standards Act. It is related to Arkansas's increases in minimum wage over the past few years. But the bottom line is, if you're a GAA, you need to know that you're not going to get a paycheck on December 31st so that you can plan accordingly. Now, just as an example, oh, and that is fact number one. So that is the first fact of the six that I have that you might, I want to make sure everybody walks away understanding is that GAAs don't receive that December 31st check. Okay, so here's my example. <clears throat> I'm going to try to do a better job today of explaining where these numbers are coming from. So if you are working um, for fall semester and spring semester, and that's why you see this, this date range right here of August 15th through May 15th. So that's fall and spring. And if you're working a full-time GA, which is 20 hours a week, then the minimum salary that we can pay you is $8,600. Now, GAs often make more than that. We have some departments that pay $9,000 or $10,000. Um, not all GAs are on a full assistantship. Some GAs are on half assistantship, so they're working 10 hours a week. That would be the minimum pay would be half of this or 4300 So your particular instance may be different from this example, but this will help me to show the point I'm making about the paycheck. So if you have a GAA whose overall sal salary is 8600 and we're comparing that to a GTA, for example, then you're going to see that there's actually one less pay period in this time scale for the GAA because they are not getting that December 31st paycheck. Well, what that means is their paycheck per pay period, and this is the amount that you're paid before taxes, so they will take some taxes out, but this is the before tax amount. Um, you can see that the GAA paycheck is just a little bit higher. That's because they have the one less pay period that it's being paid over. Um, in the end, the GA and the, the GAA and the GTA who have the same salary, they're getting the same amount of money. But that difference in the number of pay periods impacts how many, the amount of each check. So again, this is the first fact. It's this idea that GAAs don't receive a paycheck December 31st. If you're not sure of what type of assistantship you hold, then I would say contact Leslie George, and I'll share her email at the end, but it is lgeorge at uca.edu. Leslie is our person in the graduate school that handles and approves all of the GA hiring paperwork, and she would be the one that could tell you um, what type of assistantship you're on so that you would know about that December paycheck. So when we come back to Jamal's situation, the reason that he did not get a paycheck on December 31st was because he's a GAA and therefore he's not going to get a check. So it's unfortunate that he was not aware of this. He was counting on that money at that moment, but there's absolutely nothing that we can do in terms of paying him, which is not something I'm really proud to say, but it is the reality of it. So it's really important that we pay attention to these things on the front end. My next scenario is Jennifer and Jennifer is a graduate student. She's ready to start fall semester. <clears throat> During the summer, she took some classes and she did really well. She made A's in them except for one. She received an incomplete, but no worries. She will be able to complete that work during the fall semester. So the question is, should Jennifer be worried? 
So from this, we're going to look at information that's related either to your initial appointment or your reappointment and what that criteria is that allows you to continue with your assistantship. Excuse me, the first um, idea I have here is that you have to have a 3.0 or higher GPA. And that's true in general, like all graduate students on our campus are expected to maintain that 3.0 or higher. And that's in your degree GPA as well as your, um, your uh, overall graduate GPA. <clears throat> I have an asterisk here because it does, it can happen that if a GA has a GPA that drops below 3.0, they go on probation, they can stay on their graduate assistantship for one semester. This has not always been the case. As recent as just maybe two years ago, we changed the policy because before, if your GPA dropped low, below, then you lost your assistantship, which is not a really good practice, or I didn't think that was a really good practice. So we changed the policy. You get one semester of being a GA while you're on probation. But after that, if you're not off probation, then you will lose your assistantship. So this idea that you can be on probation for only one semester is my second fact that I wanna make sure everybody is aware of. Now, I would really prefer y'all not be on probation. Okay, so let's work really hard to keep our grades up. And here's the thing, like as a GA, you have to register for nine hours so that you're a full-time student. You don't have the option of dropping a class if, um, if you start like lagging behind in one. And most of the time graduate students who withdraw from classes do so because they're falling behind and not making the deadlines. It's not because they can't handle the work. So it's really important that you stay on top of your work, that you stay on top of everything that's scheduled so that you can stay in those classes and make sure you're keeping your nine hours so that you have your, uh, you qualify for that assistantship. But if something happens, you find yourself on probation, you can continue that assistantship for one semester. That's fact number two. Okay, so back to my list of appointment qualifications or reappointment, if that's the case. The second point is that as a graduate assistant, you cannot have any incomplete grades, whether that's an X grade, which is what we've been using in the past, or an incomplete grade, which I believe we're moving to incompletes this fall semester. Um, you can't have those on your transcript um, if you're a graduate assistant, because that says to me, that you're not making progress towards your degree. So you've hit a moment where now it indicates you're falling behind a little bit. And so we can't have that, like you're expected to be making progress along with your graduate assistantship. So no incomplete grades. And that policy is fact number three. So remember I started with six, I said there were three. Um, and I started with six, we're on number three. And that's that you cannot have incomplete grades, X's or I's on your transcript. Now, sometimes people will get an incomplete for fall semester and there's like a long period of time in between fall and spring. So they have the chance to finish that work before spring semester. And if that happens, that's great. But if we were to enter spring semester and that X or incomplete grade is still sitting there, then we would uh, cancel your assistantship and you wouldn't continue. So make sure that you're staying on top of your work and that you're getting everything done so that you can get the grades that you've earned and be able to continue with your assistantship. Back to my list. What other things are needed for appointment? Uh, you do need to have a good report from your academic advisor. Um, so all graduate assistants are evaluated by their supervisor or someone towards the end of their appointment period. And so we wanna make sure that you have a really great report if you're a master's student, your position is only available to you for two years. For doc students, that's four years. Um, if you find yourself like you're getting the end of the time period of your assistantship and you just need another semester or so, I mean, you can always request that. And as long as there's funding available, it won't be an issue. But do know that it is something to find out about. We try to get you in, make the progress and get you out. So that's two years for master's students, four years for doctoral students. And then I've said this a couple of times, you need to be making satisfactory progress towards your degree. So if we look back at our scenario with Jennifer, um, this is a case where, okay, she's got that incomplete grade. And so either her hiring paperwork has been held up and it's not going to be processed, 
or if it's already been processed, then we would be looking at canceling it. But before we did any of that, we would reach out to Jennifer, we would reach out to her instructor and say, hey, what's going on? When are we going to get this um, cleared up? And if it's happening like right now, or relatively soon, then we'll work with you and we'll we'll make it work. But just know that it does become a question. It does become an issue if you have incomplete grades. All right, so here's Sonny. Sonny's from California and he receives an out-of-state fee waiver thanks to his graduate assistantship. So um, in the past, he's been working a full assistantship. So that was 20 hours a week. But now he's switching to a half assistantship, which is 10 hours a week because he knows he's got a tough course load ahead of him. So he made the decision to change to 10 hours. Is this going to mess him up? Of course, now y'all are probably catching on to my scenarios that it probably is going to mess him up and that's why I'm sharing this information. Um, but let's see what, what's going on here. There aren't really benefits to being a graduate assistant. It is a non-benefited position. And so I've labeled these benefits in quotation marks because um, again, it's non-benefited. HR would tell you there are no benefits. Um, but one of these benefits, in air quotes, is that you do get the out-of-state fee waiver. And that's the case if you are um, working as a full-time GA. So as long as you're on a full assistantship, if you're a student from out-of-state, then we will waive that out-of-state fee and you're paying just your in-state tuition. Um, there are other ways to get the out-of-state fee waiver. For example, if you live in a state that is adjacent, to Arkansas, so that like Missouri or Oklahoma or Texas or Louisiana or Tennessee, you know, they're, they're literally touching Arkansas, then you can get the out-of-state fee waiver regardless, I believe, of how many hours you're taking. But this, if you're in, you know, if you're from New York and you're counting on your graduate assistantship to get you the out-of-state fee waiver, then you have to be on a full assistantship for that to be the case. And that is fact number four. So really important to note that for those of you that are out of state. So when we look at Sonny's situation, Sonny was from California. He was counting on his graduate assistantship to get the um, out of state fee waiver. Now he's not going to get it. Is it going to mess him up? Well, I mean, he's not going to get the fee waiver. He can still pay his tuition and still continue in the program. So it's not going to kick him out or anything, but his tuition bill is going to be higher than perhaps what he would have expected otherwise. And so that's why it's important to be aware of that fact. So here's my next scenario. <clears throat> um, Ray receives a tuition remission with her assistantship and um, they have, her department or whomever has committed to pay up to $5,000 in tuition and fees. So she took a look at her fall tuition bill and saw that it was $3,500. And so she's planning to use the remaining $1,500 for books and rent. And so the question is, can Ray do this? Is she going to be able to use that $1,500 for that purpose? So when we talk about the perks and the benefits of um, graduate assistantships, the out-of-state fee waiver is one, but tuition remission is another for some graduate assistants, not all. Um, so only about 20% of the graduate assistants on this campus receive tuition remission. And if you're sitting there wondering, do I get it? Then you probably don't because that's usually, um, it is communicated to you by the department at the time that we are offering the assistantship, okay? Um, most of those GAs that are getting the tuition remission are either grant funded, so the money's being paid by the grant, or there are some departments that have some tuition dollars. But again, 80% of our graduate assistants are not receiving tuition remission. Um, for those who do, that is money that goes to tuition and then course-related fees. And it is important to note that it will not exceed the actual cost of tuition and fees. And I believe that it, that is fact number five. So that's important, right? Like if you were on a scholarship, as an undergraduate student and you had that $5,000, they would pay the tuition and then very likely disperse the remaining part to you so that you could put that towards rent, uh, room and board or rent or buying your books or what have you. But this graduate assistantships, the tuition remission that comes with those is not going to do that. They're gonna pay the actual cost for tuition and fees and that's it. 
Now, if you have a, like a music scholarship, because we I know we have graduate students that receive music scholarships or some other funding source, this may not be the case. It may be that they give you that extra money and you'll need to ask them, whoever that funder is about that. But for those of you that are receiving tuition remission based on your graduate assistantship, it's not gonna give you the extra money that's left over. That is fact number five. So in this situation, Ray is going to look at her bill and see where it has been paid and it will zero out and there will not be money that then comes to her, okay? So benefits, out-of-state fee waiver, tuition remission, and then quality practical work experience. And so I do wanna reiterate that this is one of those things where the more you put into it, the more you're gonna get out of it. You have a phenomenal opportunity to gain experience and knowledge in your own um, professional area, whatever your discipline is. So you wanna take advantage of that and get the most out of it so that you get the most out of your assistantship and your program. Um, again, why can't I see my thing? Um, so GA responsibilities, you want to, one of the things is that you are making steady progress towards degree. Um, that happens by, well, I mean, you're kind of forced to as a graduate assistant, you have to take at least nine hours in the semester, but that also means, you know, you're making good grades so that you're not re repeating a class, that you're staying on your degree plan, that you're not taking classes that don't apply, et cetera, so that we see that you're making progress towards graduation, because believe it or not, we want to get you in, we want to get you out. Um, you have to register each academic semester during your appointment. So if you are a graduate assistant in the summer and, um, you know, you aren't necessarily, so that's something you have to check on with your department. But if you find yourself on an assistantship in the summer, you are expected to register in the summer. Um, for fall and spring, that's nine hours each semester for full assistantship. In the summer, that means you're registering for three hours, at least three hours. Um, if you're on a part-time assistantship, then you can register as a part-time student. Uh, so do be aware of that, that this requirement of being registered for the full nine hours is for full assistantships. There's an expectation that if you miss any work hours that you make those up and you do so in the same month that you're paid. Um, department people are the ones that keep up with the hours that you're working. So you would just work with your uh, departmental admin or whomever is keeping track of your work hours to make sure you're making up your hours. We do expect you to maintain standards of academic honesty and integrity. I've had an increase in academic integrity violations over the past year or so. A lot of it is plagiarism. Um, sometimes it's not like big time plagiarism, like it feels really small, like maybe copying somebody's homework or copying a small passage and putting it on a discussion board. But regardless, that's all plagiarism, whether it's big or small. And so that's an academic integrity violation and that will very quickly put your graduate assistantship in jeopardy. So make sure that you're doing exactly what you know you're supposed to be doing as a student. And then the last thing I'll put on here in terms of GA responsibilities is that you all will be receiving an email um, soon, like once the semester gets started, that has some information about modules that HR, Human Resource, is asking you to do. Um, and I'm telling you that you need to get those done by the end of September. So HR will send you the information, you go online, you know how it is, you read some information, they tell you some stories, you answer some questions, and you go through the series of modules. They may give you a deadline that's further off in the academic year, but we need to go ahead and get these done in September. So please be on the lookout for that. So now I've got this scenario with Sydney and Sydney's a full assistantship. So she is working 20 hours a week and Sydney is great. Like everybody wants Sydney to be working for them because she does such great work. And there's another department on campus who wants her to teach a class for them this semester. Sydney's super excited because she is really wanting to teach and she knows that this would be a chance to make more money. So the question is, is this additional work on campus okay? So this falls under the heading of um, concurrent employment. 
And if you're a GA on a full assistantship, you may not engage in concurrent employment on campus without consent of the department program and me as the graduate dean. So you have to have approval from, bro from both. And this is fact number six. And so I want to spend a little bit of time talking about concurrent employment and when it might be granted and when it might not. So some things to note. Um, a lot of times I'll get somebody who comes to me and says, you know, I'm a GA over here. This department wants to hire me as a student worker. And the answer to that every time will be no. And that's because our HR system does not allow a GA who's a salaried worker to also be a student worker who's paid hourly. So it's how all that is set up. It just cannot happen. So no upfront, that will not be approved. Um, in the case, sometimes there are people who say, I'm a full-time graduate assistant over here. I'd like to um, do more work under my assistantship. And we would call that an overload. Um, so if the additional work, if you're asking for additional work, it has to be for a fixed period of time. So that means there's a definite start date. There's a definite end date. It involves no more than five additional hours per week. And then the other piece is that it has to not exceed one month. So if I have someone who come, and I've had this where somebody says, you know, I'm a full assistantship over here. This department wants to hire me for five hours a week for the rest of the school year. Um, we, while you can set some start and end dates on that, and you could set it at five hours a week, it exceeds that one month. And so it's not going to be approved. Um, that's actually, it's not fair to you because you already, if you've got the 20 hours a week, you've got the full load as a graduate student, that's plenty of work. Um, the last thing on here is if it meets those criteria, so the less than a month, five hours a week, um, then the last piece to think is make sure that that additional work is a meaningful experience related to your discipline. So, you know, if you're in nutrition and wanting to do extra work over, I don't know, for the radio station or something, you're going to have to really help me to understand how that aligns with your growth as a nutritionist, right? So that's the, those are the factors that we take into consideration for concurrent employment on campus. I do occasionally get questions about concurrent employment off campus, and I'm just going to say on that, I don't have a way to track that. And that's all I'm going to say. So if we get back to Sydney, Sydney's not going to be approved to teach that class because it's going to involve a full semester of work. Occasionally, there are some teaching opportunities that like last a month. That would be great, but a full semester, no, it's not going to be improved. So I'm down to SUMIT, and I feel like SUMIT might be my last scenario because I've gone through six key facts and I've got one uh, lesson, key lesson for y'all to learn. So I think this is my last one. Uh, SUMIT receives a tuition scholarship with his assistantship. The department that he works for promised to provide $2,500 for fall semester and spring semester to pay his tuition. Um, and Summit knows that's not going to cover all of his tuition, and he's okay with that. But when he got his fall bill, all of the scholarship was paid. It covered everything. And so he's excited. He's very thankful. But he knows that he got more than the $2,500. And so the question is, should Summit be worried? Like, should he just go, oh, that's awesome and hope for the best, or is this gonna mess him up in the future? Here's the thing, if things don't look right, always ask the graduate school. And that is the key lesson. Be mindful of what your bill looks like, be mindful of your paycheck, ask the questions, know to ask, know what to expect. If you something doesn't look right, reach out to us, because in that scenario with Summit, what will happen is he'll go into the spring semester and they'll say, I'm sorry, we paid all your money last semester, so we don't have money to cover your tuition this semester and Summit is out of luck, okay? And I don't wanna see that happen. So again, six facts, one key lesson, and the one big lesson is reach out if things don't look right. I put Leslie's email on here, mine's there as well. And so at this point, I'm going to turn things over to John Scott if you've not heard of John Scott, he is our GA support, um, no, graduate student support GA. And this is a fairly new position. I think this is our third year with it. So we're continuing to grow. But he is here to work with you all.
and help you all and answer questions and provide guidance and so forth. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen okay. and turn this over to you, John Scott, who's going to take over for the well-being portion of our afternoon. Thank you. I hope this works out better than yesterday. Well, yep, it's working. Okay. There you That's go. Good. Good, good deal. So thank you everyone for being here. And uh, so I'm going to get started and just talk first a little bit about the background of this position and my background as well, and especially about the UCA's mission for graduate student well-being. And then I'm going to zero in on a more specific aspect of that, especially one that relates to graduate assistance, and that is work-life balance. And there are a couple of parts that I want to talk about within that as well. And then lastly, I'll talk to you about how you can get in touch with me if you'd like to schedule a meeting and talk about any of these things or anything else. And also go over some of the things we've been working on in the graduate school, such as on Dr. Barlow's podcast, Grad Chats with Dr. Beeb. So I'll get to that at the end. So first, a little bit about me. So my name is John Scott Kelly, and I am the Graduate Student Support GA. And like Dr. Barlow was just saying, this is the third year that this position has been um, enacted. Um, and what my job is, my role is, is to try to boost graduate student well-being. But part of that too, I, the reason why I'm here today is that sometimes these things aren't even recognizable. These aren't recognized as problems. Um, some parts of graduate school, such as excessive stress or seem like part of the process, but sometimes they can go too far. And I'm gonna try to help you make that determination when it has gone too far. And another thing about it too, is that I wanna talk about some of the parts of graduate school that make it different than undergraduate studies and why that stress is elevated. So hopefully all of this will come together and boost well-being in the long run. So first though, I wanna get, kind of get a feel for how you're experiencing graduate school, how it seems to you, the levels of well-being and things like that. So I have a few polls for you. The first one is what percentage of graduate students reported experiencing stress-related problems that interfere with their academic performance and well-being? Five to 15%. 15 to 25%, 25 to 35%, 35 to 45%. So you can base this off of your experiences or just what you think about graduate students in general. So this was a nationwide poll. So the majority answer is 35 to 45%, and indeed that is the answer. So these are the, this is the percentage of graduate students who were reported experiencing stress that actually interfere with their academic performance and well-being. And this is important because we're all here. I'm a graduate student too. We're all here because we want to develop professionally. We want to have to realize our academic potentials and experience well-being along the way. And so the fact that this is actually interfering with it, it's going beyond just the experience of stress and actually interfering with the thing we're here to do, that really becomes a problem. And so that's something that we want to, to change if we can. So I have another poll for you. Self-reported anxiety and depression are blank among graduate students compared to the general population. Three times lower, equally as high, three times higher, six times higher. And again, this can be based on how you've been experiencing it, how you, how you notice your peers, or just in general, your general feel for this. Okay, three times higher. And that's, that's, that's the common answer. That was the same as yesterday. But it actually does turn out that it's six times higher, which is, it's, it's hard to believe. It was hard for me to believe when I first saw it too. And so, I mean, this, this points to some serious problems in graduate school that, that, can, that could be uh, remedied in some way just with a position such as mine. And that's what we, we've been trying to do. And you'd think that given this, that there'd be a lot of attention on this in graduate schools, that this would be something that graduate schools would like to really pay close attention to. And this leads to my third poll. What percentage of graduate institutions reported having a campus-wide plan, vision, or mission statement that specifically references the mental health and well-being of graduate students? 24%, 44%, 64%, or 84%? And just like before, your general, your general impression of this, how much do you think? Okay, yeah, I think you are picking up on my tone with this. Because you, it's it's surprising that it doesn't end up being 24% given the stats beforehand. So the, I think the, the key thing about this is that the graduate students part. Some institutions do have some kind of mission statement for mental health and well-being for undergraduates where it's kind of vague, it's unclear. But UCA wanted to be different. We want to have a clear 
mission, mental health's mission statement for graduates, graduate students in particular. So we came up with this one. The UCA Graduate School strives to create an academic community that values mental health in a manner that facilitates the success of graduate students. So this is, a, this is really the key aspect of my position, what I'm trying to do. Hopefully by providing information like I'm going to today, that it'll actually help you realize your academic potential, help uh, remedy things that are getting in the way of realizing that potential. And with that, I wanna talk about work-life balance. And this is a huge issue in graduate assistantships in particular, because we're already so busy with our studies. And here we are, we have more responsibilities we have to take care of plus all the things about life that we want that are meaningful that we want to keep up with too. So it can be difficult to do that. And I'm going to talk about burnout and financial stress with this. And I I'm, I'm, imagine that many of you have heard of burnout, but it's, it, I'm going to go into some more details that you may not be aware of. So generally speaking, burnout is this state of chronic stress. It's this long-term persistent stress that leads to physical and emotional exhaustion as well as attachment. And that comes with in many different forms. So first, you do have the physical and emotional exhaustion. And this tends to be the one that's first experienced too, and it tends to be the one that people think of when they think of burnout, just being just very tired. It can even lead to things like emotions like sadness and anger, even like a decreased appetite, and it can damage your immune system as well, decrease its efficiency. But it can lead to other things as well that maybe don't seem like they're related to burnout at first glance or when you're experiencing them. One is self-efficacy, self-inefficacy, I should say. And this is a sense that you're not being as productive as you used to be, that you're not doing as good of work as you used to. And so this can lead to low productivity, less motivation for that work. And now also is associated with cynicism. And this is a loss of enjoyment in your work tasks themselves. So the tasks don't seem as meaningful. You don't really have that sense of purpose when you're completing the task. It doesn't seem like it really matters. And then the last one is depersonalization. So it's kind of like cynicism, but turned outward towards other people. It can be people within your department or within your program, but it just tends to be this negative attitude towards people, creating distance between yourself and other people, just not really being involved. And that's, that all goes along with that detachment part. So you can see how when you have feelings of burnout, how this can really permeate outwards and it can really develop this cycle that creates a lot of damage, especially with, with academic performance. So what I wanna do is try to give you some, some tools that you can use to help reduce burnout when it does occur or keep it from occurring. And since it really thrives and it is built on that, that exhaustion, what I want to focus in on are stress relieving, energy replenishing activities. And one of them that you may have heard of is self-care. And self-care can include many, many different things. It tends to be something that's social. It tends to be like social relationships and activities are important. A proper diet and proper nutrition to fuel your body to continue forward. Having good sleep hygiene. So this would be like turning the lights down around you know, 8 p.m. or something like that and getting ready for bed, winding down, having a consistent sleep schedule, staying off the phone too, which is hard. Time in nature, other spiritual type activities. But then two other ones that are really difficult are for graduate students in particular, at least in my experience, are leisure and study breaks. So it seems like it, it, in my experience, again, that it can be this, there's a sense of guilt attached to leisure sometimes. There's always something to do. It can be really difficult to take breaks. It feels, it can feel like you need to push forward, just continue, continue, continue. But that leads to its own problems. And it's just an unsustainable approach. And that's when it leads to things like a burnout, especially that exhaustion portion of burnout. So with that, I think it's important to talk about self-compassion, a way to maybe help uh, get, get rid of some of that guilt when, when you do engage in leisure activities. And self-compassion has three main components. One is self-kindness. This might be the one that comes to mind when you think of self-compassion. It's really just being kind to yourself, saying nice things to yourself, thinking, thinking of th yourself in a positive way. But then there are two other parts of it as well. Another one is common humanity. So this is the sense that you're not unique in your suffering, that other people are also suffering or other people are also sharing in your experience, that it's not just your experience that is, that is part of humanity, that you're joined in with other people. And then also mindfulness. And you may have been practicing mindfulness meditation or engaging in mindfulness practices, 
but just by and large, the general underlying part of uh, mindfulness that's helpful for this is a non-judgmental accepting attitude, especially towards oneself when, when it comes to self-compassion. And as I mentioned before, with self-care, relationships are really important. So it, social support is something I wanted to really talk about in depth. And it, it is important to maintain meaningful relationships you have with people. And this can be with people within your program, within your GA ship, or it could be your family members and friends. But it, they can be really revivifying, especially when it comes to things like a sense of belonging, gratitude, and stability that can help you continue forward. And it does turn out that this is one of the most potent predictors of graduate well-being. Seen it in many different studies that this tends to be the one that people neglect and but also is the one that predicts the most well-being. And kind of a subset of that is the advisor-student relationship. And I think this one's important too because it can really enhance your sense of professional belonging. If you're trying to get into your program and feel like you belong, your advisor can be very helpful with that or just mentors. It doesn't necessarily have to be a formal advisor, but people who can who can be mentors. And these, these often are most helpful when they're built on a reciprocal trusting relationship where you both feel like you're giving something and you're both getting something that doesn't seem so one-sided. That's when it really tends to feel meaningful and rewarding. And oftentimes with this though, there needs to be a discussion regarding boundaries and boundaries can be another great way to relieve stress. I'm sure all of you have experienced times in which you felt increased stress and you wish that you had maybe done something differently or said something to, to draw that line and say, I, I just can't do this right now. So I, I have a couple of ideas on how you might be able to do that. One is to think about the type of stress that you're currently experiencing or what the situation is inducing. So it might be a, creating a form of constructive stress. This is the type of stress that is, it's difficult, but you also have the sense that it's taking you forward, that you're growing as a person, as a professional, as a result of that stress. And that might be something that you do go ahead and take on and, and accept as a challenge. However, there's also destructive stress. And this is the type of stress that actually interferes with that process. So you don't feel like it's going to be help you help it will be helping you grow or helping you develop as a professional. And that might be the time to, to draw the line and, and say that this, this is just too much for me at this time, or have that conversation, just to have the open dialogue with, with your supervisor or your advisor. And kind of with that too, when you're able to see where that line is, it might help you to, to know when it's time to ask for help. And in my experience, again, my my mentors and advisors have always been there ready to help but they don't know until it, it is it is said so sometimes knowing where that boundary is within yourself can help you initiate that conversation now another part of graduate student stress is um, financially related and it, again like dr barlow was saying i mean it could be things like not knowing that you're not going to get that paycheck on december 31st or just not having that planned out so this has to do with uncertainty related anxiety. And it's a form of worry that's related to not really having a clear path forward and not really knowing. So this can be when you have too many good choices, too many bad choices that are causing conflicts, or it could just be that things are unclear and, and, and clarity is needed. So when it comes to financial stress, budgeting can be a way to reduce some of that anxiety, especially the uncertainty related anxiety. It helps with financial decision making. If you know your budget, you know you can make financial decisions confidently. It also can promote clarity, so it can get kind of reduce anxiety that way. Things aren't so vague anymore. And there are lots of budgeting apps, but I know um, Mint and Pocket Guard are, are, are very popular. And this might be helpful if you're trying to reduce some of that financial stress. And lastly, I encourage anyone who is, has any questions about this presentation, who has any questions for me in general, or who would like to schedule a one-on-one -on -one appointment to contact me at gradsupport at uca.edu. I welcome any kind of email, any kind of inquiry, anything you might have where I can help, I'd, I'd be happy to do that. If you would like to meet one-on-one, -on -one, we can meet on Google Meet by appointment and we can figure that out through the email. And I did the same thing yesterday. I'm going to shamelessly plug my Twitter account. I got a couple new followers yesterday. So I hope the same happens today, but you can follow me on Twitter at UCA Grad Support. And then I, I would really like to take this opportunity to talk about Dr. Barlow's podcast, Grad Chats with Dr. B. 
you can find this on pretty much any podcast platform, I'm pretty sure, uh, especially the popular ones. And we've talked about, well, we talked about burnout in particular, just like today, but we talked about a lot of different things. And Dr. Barlow has talked about these types of things with other people as well. I talked about the imposter phenomenon, but then Dr. Barlow talked with graduate students about it. So fellow graduate students talked about their own experiences with the imposter phenomenon. I thought that was a really cool podcast. And it was from different years. So they had their own perspective. They were at different points in the program. I think it really turned out well. She's also talked with a, a student about networking and talked about gratitude. We spelled it gratitude with the D and we thought that was pretty cool uh, for graduate students. And also nutrition and Dr. Parlow has talked with various deans of different colleges within the graduate schools. So within the graduate school, so if you'd like to maybe know a little bit more about the dean of your college, it would be a good idea to go check out that those podcasts, whichever one they were on. I think that, that'd be something you might be interested in. And that, that is all I have for today. I thank you all again. Um, I'll throw it back to you, Dr. Barlow. I think you're okay. ready for questions. Yeah, we're ready for questions. Um, so please use the Q&A feature to put your questions in. I have one question that's been that came up earlier, so I'll go ahead and answer it. And it was given at the time I was talking about how the different pay periods for GAAs and GTAs and so forth. So the question was, do you does UCA believe a GAA student salary needs are different than a GTA or a GRA? And the answer to that is no. There's not. It's not a um, university thing that's related to those different pay scales, but it is. Um, the best solution that we could find, given the, the constraints that we are in, to meet the expectations of the Fair Labor Standards Act, which specifically lists GTAs, GRAs, and housing GAs as being exempt, but not administrative GAs. And so for that reason, we had to um, get all of that information, put it in, and decide what can we do to make sure we're adhering to the law, and that was our solution. So it's not not ideal, but I hope that by putting this information in front of you today, that it allows everyone to plan accordingly. Um, okay, so another question's come in. Are there any planned grad student social events this semester? It's really interesting. I just finished a podcast interview last hour um, that'll come out this uh, fall about connecting and making connections. And we realized in talking through that podcast that most programs will have different planned events for their students in their programs. So that would be my first piece of advice would be to talk to your program coordinator and see what's happening. Um, you may find that your program is filled with things. You may also find that you're in a program that doesn't have anything planned. And if they don't, then encourage it. I'm really interested in thinking about what are some social events that the graduate school could provide and what might that look like. And so if that's something that's in, of interest to you, please reach out to me and um, via email and we'll have a conversation about what are some ways that we can, as a graduate school, help to support our students because we recognize that the social aspect is just as important as the academic and all the other stuff as well. Um, let's see, we have another question. So I had said earlier that a GA cannot also be a student worker position. And then this person is asking for some clar clarity about if that's true for part-time GAs and full-time GAs. And the answer to that is yes. If you are on any graduate assistantship, whether it's full or part-time, then you cannot also be a student worker on campus. And again, it's because one position type is a salaried position and the other one is an paid hourly position and they just don't job in the HR system. Um, so if you have, like if you're on a part-time graduate assistantship and you're interested in doing extra work, you're going to have to find a department that can pay you as a graduate assistant. And I just, I don't know what their budgets look like and whether they can move money around and do that. But I mean, we do have some people that are on a half assistantship for this department and a half assistantship for this other department. So in reality, it's a whole assistantship. It's just split across those two departments. There's not a lot of those, but we do have some. Um, but yeah, regardless of how many hours you're working, you cannot be a GA and a student worker. So good question. 
Okay, here's another one. So last fall, I learned that our cub emails, even if appointed as a GA, will not allow us to create a space on Google Classroom. Is there any way to adjust things to allow for that privilege? Oh, that's interesting. I wasn't aware of that. Hmm. I'll have to write that down and get that information back to you. So I'm going to write down student name. So I'll have to check into that. I know that um, the different email accounts, like a regular UCA email versus a CUB email, are from different domains. I don't know if that's the right term, but I know that when I invite someone with a CUB account via, you know, if I'm inviting them to a calendar event, the calendar folks view that CUB account as external to the organization. So that's what you're dealing with, is that the CUB account is not viewed as internal to the organization. I suspect that most of the um, people who work with this haven't thought of that as an issue because they're use most people are using Blackboard. And so I'm wondering if this is um, also an issue in Blackboard or not. So I'll just have to do some investigating and then I'll reach back out to you and get that question answered for you, okay? Let's see if we have some other questions. Yesterday, we got a lot of questions about that pay scale stuff. Maybe I did a better job of that example to take, John Scott. <laughs> Live and learn, right? <laughs> okay, well, I'm not seeing any more answer, uh, any more questions that I need to answer. So I'll just start wrapping up um, again. I want to thank you all for your time. I want to congratulate you on having this opportunity as a graduate assistant. Um, like sometimes you don't know what you've got till it's gone. And like I look back at my time as a graduate assistant and it was phenomenal. It was a wonderful learning opportunity and uh, just a lot of opportunities to try different things, learn who I was as a professional and grow within my discipline. So, you know, kudos to you all for taking up this um, opportunity to grow in this way as a part of your graduate program. Do know that we're here. John Scott is here. He answers questions, whether it's, um, you know, not knowing where to find something or if you need someone to just talk to and maybe you don't feel comfortable going over to the counseling center for some reason, but you feel like, hey, if I could just talk to John Scott, get some, you know, get somebody to listen, then he's here for that too. John Scott, you're a licensed what? You're like a I'm licensed counselor. Um, so that he is definitely a resource to help with overall well-being. Um, and then if there's anything that I can do, uh, please let us know. And remember that key lesson. If you see something that just doesn't look right, don't assume it's going to fix itself. Reach out to us so we can get it all taken care of and not have surprises when we don't want those surprises. So I hope you all have a wonderful, wonderful uh, academic year, fall semester, especially since that starts next week. I can't believe it. Next week. Mm -hmm. Wow. Y'all have a great afternoon. Grad Chats with Dr. B. Be looking for some new episodes coming out in the coming weeks. <laughs>